Book Talk begins at 9 minutes and 40 seconds. Welcome to Craftlit, the podcast for crafters who love books. My name is Heather Ordover, and I'm podcasting from where the Delaware River meets the Old York Road, New Hope, Pennsylvania. Episode 641, Thimble Nundrum. This episode of Craftlet is brought to you by our patrons. Visit patreon.com slash craftlet and join the many people over there who are making this episode and all Craftlet episodes lately possible for you. The patrons we would like to highlight this week are Yvonne Ellsworth, Kelly Cutforth, Cecilia Real, Shelley Marr, and Damon and Marna. Thank you. I couldn't do it without you. So, my thimble nundrum this week isn't actually a nundrum as much as it is a question to you. I have been feeling better for the last week up until literally this morning. So I started kind of paying attention to the world again, and it was very exciting. And one of the things that happened was something popped up in my YouTube feed that caught my eye. And I thought, ooh, I haven't seen anything like that for a while. I'm going to follow that rabbit hole. And the rabbit hole led me to a video from Marion's World talking about Margaret Fabrizio. Margaret Fabrizio has been on YouTube for 16 years. So putting that into context, she's been doing this one year less than Craftlet has been going. I think that means she may have been the very first person ever on YouTube. I mean, that's nuts. She's in her 90s. She is still posting videos. She is extraordinary. And she's a musician, but she's also somebody who is a crafty person. She makes things. She makes a lot of quilts and different kinds of quilts. And she got really interested in quilts made by the Sita people. I'm an American. What the heck do we know? Part of the African diaspora included many, many hundreds of years ago, people from Africa moving to India. So there's a subset of Indian textile artists that have brought this African tradition with them. And it's been going on for a really, really long time. And all of this other stuff, I think why this showed up in my feed was because I'd mentioned before the embroidery and the crazy quilting and the slow stitching. And I suppose this was just the next logical thing to show up in my feed because it's somewhere between slow stitching and quilting for people who don't cut things very well. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't mean that as a diss. I mean, like with Manx quilting, you weren't necessarily going to automatically have access to scissors or certainly not to a rotary blade cutter. And there's a, a lot of precision in modern quilting that just is not part of my life. So anytime I see something like English paper piecing or crazy quilting, something that does not require me to have pre-measured correctly, that is a good thing. This looked like that. And more than that, it's using not quilting thread, but the closest thing I could find was like size 8-2 natural warping cotton. So thin, thin enough to use with like a chenille needle, but thick enough to really show up on fabric. Why am I bringing this up? because a, it's cool, and I know that you guys like learning all sorts of crazy things just like me, but also because I caught a glimpse towards the end of an interview with Margaret where she demonstrates this particular technique. And she is, there's just this glimpse that I got, and I, I caught the video at that time code and and I've saved that to the show notes so that you won't have to watch the entire interview if you aren't interested, but you can at least see what I'm talking about. She is using, I don't know what to call it. It's a, a fist thimble, 
a tube thimble, a hand thimble. I don't know what kind of thimble it is, but I was all in on this because so, so few thimbles in the world fit my fat fingers. I totally have fat finger syndrome when it comes to texting. And that 100% bleeds over into what happens when I try and put thimbles on that are designed for women who are considerably shorter than me and more delicate than me. And yes, it's just been hugely distressing. If you could have body dysmorphia about your thimble finger, that is me. It's really ridiculous. But on top of that, the, the other problem that I've had is when I have found a thimble that fits, and I have on occasion, it's not exactly positioned where my finger needs the protection to be. So that's another problem. So I'd made myself a sashiko thimble a while ago, which I have, you know, conveniently lost. I could have sworn I had it with me just a week ago, and now it's not where I thought I left it. So when the fog clears, I'm sure I'll find it again. But in the meantime, I was really frustrated because the sashiko thimble worked with milliner's needles and even to a certain extent, chenille needles that are longer. And if you aren't familiar with a sashiko thimble, I will also put a picture of one of them in the, the show notes as well, along with a video that shows what sashiko mending looks like. It's really really cool. But Margaret Fabrizio in the example video is using, it's a tube, it's a piece of fabric that is clearly stuffed with a lot of stuff. I don't know if there's like a metal piece in the middle or a PVC pipe in the middle that's been wrapped with fabric and maybe some wadding or stuffing. I have no idea. I don't have any idea how it's made. I decided I needed to make my own because Heather is not shopping this Christmas. And so I, I actually had an old like garage sale sign, the kind that you can get for a buck 50 or two bucks at a hardware store, the kind that's like flexible plastic, but it's, it's substantial plastic. You need a good pair of scissors to cut through it. I made a tube out of that. I used some gaffer's tape. It's my go-to companion. I like it much better than duct tape threw some gaffer's tape on it to hold it together. I measured it. I made myself a little tube with boxed ends because I was excited about making this thing. Jam-packed it full of rice and millet, stitched that sucker closed, and I am not joking. This is my new favorite toy. I can push this needle through just about anything layers of fabric. And I'm finding myself, not in the example pictures that you'll see if you look at the show notes, but in real life when I'm not trying to film myself doing something that requires both of my hands, my stitches are getting quite regular using this. It's a huge revelation. So if you two have suffered from fat finger syndrome, take a look at what Margaret does. Take a look at my little pictures. I'm sure you can figure out how to make one for yourself. I'm ecstatic. So I just, I had to share the happy news with you. <laughs> Plus, some really interesting information about textile work in a part of the world that I knew there was amazing textile work going on in, right? I mean, India, saris, silk, oh my God. But I had nothing, nothing, no idea about any of this. So it was a fun little rabbit hole. And one that really, really paid off for me. I'm, I'm just so very happy. If you know what these things are called, <laughs> please let me know. You can write heather at craftlit.com. You can call 206-350-1642. You can leave a comment in the show notes wherever you are listening or even over on YouTube in the comment section. We, we do not turn the comments off, so they're always available to you that way. Anywho, we have a chapter to get to. So today we're doing chapter 51. And if you recall when we left our musketeers, it was a couple chapters ago, last chapter ended with Milady sitting down and thinking, hmm, how am I going to get out of this tight situation? But prior to that, we had the 
Musketeers now for uh, getting the letter from Lord de Winter saying, don't worry, rest easy, I got this. And that was where we left them. Today, we pick up with the Cardinal. And at first I thought, oh, this is probably just going to be another chapter that's like moving chess pieces on a board. We have to get everybody into position for the next big drama thing. And that's partly true, but mostly I think Dumas is just really enjoying these luscious characters that he has created who are so much fun to put words into the mouths of because there's some beautiful Athos and Cardinal conversationing happening in this particular chapter that just made me smile visibly. Like if people had walked by, they would have thought, wow, what did you just eat? It must have tasted really good because, ah, oh, just so, so fun. But there's a couple of things to know in advance. You're going to hear the word mole that's being used as a dike. That's the embankment that Richelieu is building to blockade the port at La Rochelle. He will mention his terrible emissary, and it actually took me a few minutes, which could be brain fog, and it could just be that it was confusing. It took me a few minutes to realize that when he says, my terrible emissary, he's talking about Milady. You're going to hear a reference to the mayor of La Rochelle. This guy was real. This guy was a hardcore Huguenot. He was not going to cave and, in fact, threatened the people of La Rochelle. If you're talking, even talking, about perhaps surrendering to the French, I will put my knife to your throat and that'll be it. It's true. That guy really was that way. That didn't necessarily mean that by the end of the siege he felt the same way, but at this point he certainly does. There's a reference to the St. Bartholomew's Day Massacre. It had to be terrifying at the time. Charles IX, who was with Catherine de' Medici, like days after Henri IV married Marguerite, who was Henry II's daughter. At that time, Henry IV was still a Protestant. They just went out and killed all the Protestants. There were like 5,000 Protestants that got killed. And it started in Paris, but then it bled out into the countrysides. So it really, it had to be a very scary time. And this was prior to where we're at in 1628. So some connective tissue is being placed in between the St. Bartholomew's Day Massacre and what Richelieu is doing with La Rochelle. There is also a reference. Now, this is, Dumas attributes this quote to Tristram, who was a pretty ruthless dude, like a soldier philosopher, who was largely responsible in bringing back some sense of order after the Hundred Years' War. So super important guy. But also, you would probably have to have, and he certainly did, a kind of strong fist to rein in the world after the chaos of the Hundred Years' War. The quote that he uses is divide to rule or divide and rule. Or in the Latin, it's more like divide in order to rule. This goes back to the Romans, but it, it also shows up in Machiavelli. And in the West, certainly growing up, I heard it referred to as divide and conquer. So same thing. It's a story that's been around for a really long time. We are all safer when we hang together. Allowing ourselves to be divided inevitably weakens us. And how do we know? Because Machiavelli said, if you want to keep in control of people, divide them, and then you can conquer them. You will hear Athos and Richelieu using the word examination. And in the modern translation, the more modern translation, uh, it's translated as interrogation, which I think is probably closer to what was going on. You're also going to hear our musketeers refer to two women in specific by name. Marianne Delorme, who 
was assumed to be the mistress of several important people, Richelieu being one of them, and Mademoiselle Degoulin. She was Richelieu's niece, and also, some people thought, one of his mistresses, which makes me go, ew, but, yeah, I don't, you know, I mean, I'm starting to wonder with all of the mistresses that there were out there, how often it actually turned out to be true, and how often it was just mean girls talking, you know, I don't know, I have no idea. But either way, the mention of these two women has a very specific effect on Richelieu, so pay attention to that. You'll also hear a reference to passing a letter through the grating, G-R-A-T-I-N-G, which struck me as particularly odd. It's a probably more poetic way to say pushing a letter through wrought iron gates, like the kind of gates that you'd find at a convent, for example. And that's all that that is. And all right, that's it. Let's listen to chapter 51 of The Three Musketeers, written by Alexandre Dumas. And if you are listening to a different version of it from what we are listening to here, please skip ahead to 42 minutes and 40 seconds. All right, catch you on the flip side. Chapter 51 of the D'Artagnan Romances, Volume 1, The Three Musketeers by Alexandre Dumas. Translated by William Robson. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Officer. Meanwhile... The cardinal looked anxiously for news from England, but no news arrived that was not annoying and threatening. Although La Rochelle was invested, however certain success might appear, thanks to the precautions taken and above all to the dike, which prevented the entrance of any vessel into the besieged city, the blockade might last a long time yet. This was a great affront to the king's army and a great inconvenience to the cardinal, who had no longer, it is true, to embroil Louis the Thirteenth with Anne of Austria, for that affair was over, but he had to adjust matters for Monsieur de Bassompierre, who was embroiled with the Duc d'Angoulême. As to Monsieur, who had begun the siege, he left to the cardinal the task of finishing it. The city, notwithstanding the incredible perseverance of its mayor, had attempted a sort of mutiny for a surrender. The mayor had hanged the mutineers. This execution quieted the ill-disposed, who resolved to allow themselves to die of hunger, this death always appearing to them more slow and less sure than strangulation. On their side, from time to time, the besiegers took the messengers which the Rochelais sent to Buckingham, or the spies which Buckingham sent to the Rochelais. In one case or the other, the trial was soon over. The cardinal pronounced the single word, HANGED. The king was invited to come and see the hanging. He came languidly, placing himself in a good situation to see all the details. This amused him sometimes a little, and made him endure the siege with patience. But it did not prevent his getting very tired, or from talking at every moment of returning to Paris, so that if the messengers and the spies had failed, his eminence notwithstanding all his inventiveness would have found himself much embarrassed. Nevertheless, Time passed on, and the Rochelais did not surrender. The last spy that was taken was the bearer of a letter. This letter told Buckingham that the city was at an extremity, but instead of adding, If your succor does not arrive within fifteen days, we will surrender, it added quite simply, If your succor does not come within fifteen days, we shall all be dead with hunger when it comes. The Rochelais then had no hope but in Buckingham. Buckingham was their messiah. It was evident that if they one day learned positively that they must not count on Buckingham, their courage would fail with their hope. The cardinal looked then with great impatience for the news from England which would announce to him that Buckingham would not come. The question of carrying the city by assault, though often debated in the council of the king, had been always rejected. In the first place, La Rochelle appeared impregnable. Then the cardinal, whatever he said, very well knew that the horror of bloodshed in this encounter, in which Frenchmen would combat against Frenchmen, was a retrograde movement of sixty years impressed upon his policy, and the cardinal was at that period what we now call a man of progress. In fact, the sack of La Rochelle and the assassination of three or four thousand Huguenots who allowed themselves to be killed 
would resemble too closely in 1628 the massacre of St. Bartholomew in 1572, and then, above all this, this extreme measure which was not at all repugnant to the king, good Catholic as he was, always fell before this argument of the besieging generals, La Rochelle is impregnable except to famine. The cardinal could not drive from his mind the fear he entertained of his terrible emissary, for he comprehended the strange qualities of this woman, sometimes a serpent, sometimes a lion. Had she betrayed him? Was she dead? He knew her well enough in all cases to know that whether acting for or against him, as a friend or an enemy, she would not remain motionless without great impediments. But whence did these impediments arise? That was what he could not know. And yet he reckoned, and with reason, on Milady. He had divined in the past of this woman terrible things which his red mantle alone could cover, and he felt, from one cause or another, that this woman was his own, as she could look to no other but himself for a support superior to the danger which threatened her. He resolved then to carry on the war alone, and to look for no success foreign to himself, but as we look for a fortunate chance. He continued to press the raising of the famous dyke, which was to starve La Rochelle. Meanwhile, he cast his eyes over the unfortunate city, which contained so much deep misery and so many heroic virtues, and recalling the saying of Louis XI, his political predecessor, as he himself was the predecessor of Robespierre, he repeated this maxim of Tristan's gossip, divide in order to reign. Henry IV, when besieging Paris, had loaves and provisions thrown over the walls. The cardinal had little notes thrown over in which he represented to the Rochelais how unjust, selfish, and barbarous was the conduct of their leaders. These leaders had corn in abundance and would not let them partake of it. They adopted as a maxim, for they too had maxims, that it was of very little consequence that women, children, and old men should die, so long as the men who were to defend the walls remained strong and healthy. Up to that time, whether from devotedness or from want of power to act against it, this maxim, without being generally adopted, nevertheless passed from theory into practice. But the notes did it injury. The notes reminded the men that the children, women, and old men whom they allowed to die were their sons, their wives, and their fathers, and that it would be more just for everyone to be reduced to the common misery in order that equal conditions should give birth to unanimous resolutions. These notes had all the effect that he who wrote them could expect, in that they induced a great number of the inhabitants to open private negotiations with the royal army. But at the moment when the cardinal saw his means already bearing fruit, and applauded himself for having put it in action. An inhabitant of La Rochelle who had contrived to pass the royal lines, God knows how, such was the watchfulness of Bassompierre, Schomberg, and the Duc d'Angoulême, themselves watched over by the cardinal, an inhabitant of La Rochelle, we say, entered the city, coming from Portsmouth, and saying that he had seen a magnificent fleet ready to sail within eight days. Still further, Buckingham announced to the mayor that at length the Great League was about to declare itself against France, and that the kingdom would be at once invaded by the English, Imperial, and Spanish armies. This letter was read publicly in all parts of the city. Copies were put up at the corners of the streets, and even they who had begun to open negotiations interrupted them, being resolved to await the succor so pompously announced. This unexpected circumstance brought back Richelieu's former anxiety, and forced him, in spite of himself, once more to turn his eyes to the other side of the sea. During this time, exempt from the anxiety of its only and true chief, the royal army led a joyous life, neither provisions nor money being wanting in the camp. All the corps rivaled one another in audacity and gaiety, to take spies and hang them, to make hazardous expeditions upon the dike or the sea, to imagine wild plans, and to execute them coolly. Such were the pastimes which made the army find these days short, which were not only so long to the Rochelais, a prey to famine and anxiety, but even to the cardinal who blockaded them so closely. Sometimes, 
when the cardinal, always on horseback, like the lowest gendarme of the army, cast a pensive glance over those works, so slowly keeping pace with his wishes, which the engineers brought from all the corners of France were executing under his orders, if he met a musketeer of the company of Treville, he drew near and looked at him in a peculiar manner, and not recognizing in him one of our four companions, he turned his penetrating look and profound thoughts in another direction. One day, when oppressed with a mortal weariness of mind, without hope in the negotiations with the city, without news from England, the cardinal went out, without any other aim than to be out of doors, and accompanied only by Cahusac and La Houdinière, strolled along the beach. Mingling the immensity of his dreams with the immensity of the ocean, he came, his horse going at a foot's pace, to a hill from the top of which he perceived behind a hedge, reclining on the sand and catching in its passage one of those rays of the sun so rare at this period of the year, seven men surrounded by empty bottles. Four of these men were our musketeers, preparing to listen to a letter one of them had just received. This letter was so important that it made them forsake their cards and their dice on the drumhead. The other three were occupied in opening an enormous flagon of colicure wine. These were the lackeys of these gentlemen. The cardinal was, as we have said, in very low spirits, and nothing when he was in that state of mind increased his depression so much as gaiety in others. Besides, he had another strange fancy which was always to believe that the causes of his sadness created the gaiety of others. Making a sign to La Houdinière and Cahusac to stop, he alighted from his horse and went toward these suspected merry companions, hoping by means of the sand which deadened the sound of his steps and of the hedge which concealed his approach to catch some words of this conversation which appeared so interesting. At ten paces from the hedge he recognized the talkative Gascon, and as he had already perceived that these men were musketeers, he did not doubt that the three others were those called the inseparables, that is to say, Athos, Porthos, and Aramis. It may be supposed that his desire to hear the conversation was augmented by this discovery. His eyes took a strange expression, and with a step of a tiger-cat he advanced toward the hedge. But he had not been able to catch more than a few vague syllables without any positive sense, when a sonorous and short cry made him start— and attracted the attention of the musketeers. "'Officer!' cried Grimaud. "'You are speaking, you scoundrel,' said Athos, rising upon his elbow and transfixing Grimaud with his flaming look. Grimaud therefore added nothing to his speech, but contented himself with pointing his index finger in the direction of the hedge, announcing by this gesture the cardinal and his escort. With a single bound the musketeers were on their feet, and saluted with respect. The cardinal seemed furious. "'It appears that messieurs the musketeers keep guard,' said he. "'Are the English expected by land, or do the musketeers consider themselves superior officers?' "'Monseigneur,' replied Athos, for amid the general fright he alone had preserved the noble calmness and coolness that never forsook him. "'Monseigneur,' The musketeers, when they are not on duty, or when their duty is over, drink and play at dice, and they are certainly superior officers to their lackeys. Lackeys, grumbled the cardinal, lackeys, who have the order to warn their masters when anyone passes, are not lackeys, they are sentinels. Your eminence may perceive that if we had not taken this precaution, we should have been exposed to allowing you to pass without presenting you our respects or offering you our thanks for the favor you have done us in uniting us. D'Artagnan, continued Athos, you who but lately were so anxious for such an opportunity for expressing your gratitude to Monseigneur, here it is. Avail yourself of it. These words were pronounced with that imperturbable phlegm which distinguished Athos in the hour of danger, and with that excessive politeness which made of him at certain moments a king more majestic than kings by birth. D'Artagnan came forward and stammered out a few words of gratitude, which soon expired under the gloomy looks of the cardinal. "'It does not signify, gentlemen,' 
continued the cardinal without appearing to be in the least swerved from his first intention by the diversion which Athos had started. "'It does not signify, gentlemen. I do not like to have simple soldiers, because they have the advantage of serving in the privileged corps, thus to play the great lords. Discipline is the same for them as for everybody else.' Athos allowed the cardinal to finish his sentence completely, and bowed in sign of assent. Then he resumed in his turn. "'Discipline, Monseigneur, has, I hope, in no way been forgotten by us. We are not on duty, and we believe that not being on duty, we were at liberty to dispose of our time as we pleased. If we are so fortunate as to have some particular duty to perform for your eminence, we are ready to obey you. Your eminence may perceive, continued Athos, knitting his brow, for this sort of investigation began to annoy him, that we have not come out without our arms. And he showed the cardinal with his finger the four muskets piled near the drum, on which were the cards and dice. Your eminence may believe, added D'Artagnan, that we would have come to meet you if we could have supposed it was Monseigneur coming toward us with so few attendants. The cardinal bit his mustache, and even his lips a little. Do you know what you look like altogether, as you are armed and guarded by your lackeys? said the cardinal. You look like four conspirators. Oh, as to that, Monseigneur, it is true, said Athos. We do conspire, as your eminence might have seen the other morning. Only we conspire against the Rochelais. Ah, you gentlemen of policy, replied the cardinal, knitting his brow in his turn. The secret of many unknown things may perhaps be found in your brains, if we could read them as you read that letter which you concealed as soon as you saw me coming. The color mounted to the face of Athos, and he made a step toward his eminence. One might think you really suspected us, Monseigneur, and we were undergoing a real interrogatory. If it be so, we trust your eminence will deign to explain yourself, and we should then at least be acquainted with our real position." "'And if it were an interrogatory?' replied the cardinal. "'Others besides you have undergone such, Monsieur Athos, and have replied thereto.' "'Thus I have told your eminence that you had but to question us, and we are ready to reply.' "'What was that letter you were about to read, Monsieur Aramis, and which you so promptly concealed?' "'A woman's letter, Monseigneur.' "'Ah, oh, yes, I see,' said the cardinal. "'We must be discreet with this sort of letters. "'But nevertheless, we may show them to a confessor, "'and you know I have taken orders.' "'Monseigneur,' said Athos with a calmness the more terrible "'because he risked his head in making this reply, "'the letter is a woman's letter, "'but it is neither signed Marianne de Lorme nor Madame d'Aguillon.' The cardinal became as pale as death. Lightning darted from his eyes. He turned round as if to give an order to Cahusac and Houdinier. Athos saw the movement. He made a step toward the muskets upon which the other three friends had fixed their eyes, like men ill-disposed to allow themselves to be taken. The cardinalists were three, the musketeers, lackeys included, were seven. He judged that the match would be so much the less equal if Athos and his companions were really plotting, and by one of those rapid turns which he always had at command, all his anger faded away into a smile. "'Well, well,' said he, "'you are brave young men, proud in daylight, faithful in darkness. We can find no fault with you for watching over yourselves when you watch so carefully over others. Gentlemen, I have not forgotten the night in which you served me as an escort to the Red Dovecot. If there were any danger to be apprehended on the road I am going, I would request you to accompany me. But as there is none, remain where you are, finish your bottles, your game, and your letter. Adieu, gentlemen. 
and remounting his horse, which Cahusac led to him, he saluted them with his hand and rode away. The four young men, standing and motionless, followed him with their eyes without speaking a single word until he had disappeared. They then looked at one another. The countenances of all gave evidence of terror, for notwithstanding the friendly adieu of his eminence, they plainly perceived that the cardinal went away with rage in his heart. Athos alone smiled with a self-possessed, disdainful smile. When the cardinal was out of hearing and sight, "'That Grimaud kept bad watch,' cried Porthos, who had a great inclination to vent his ill-humor on somebody. Grimaud was about to reply to excuse himself. Athos lifted his finger, and Grimaud was silent. "'Would you have given up the letter, Aramis?' said D'Artagnan. "'I,' said Aramis in his most flute-like tone, "'I had made up my mind. If he had insisted upon the letter being given up to him, I would have presented the letter to him with one hand, and with the other I would have run my sword through his body.' "'I expected as much,' said Athos, "'and that was why I threw myself between you and him. Indeed, this man is very much to blame for talking thus to other men.' One would say he had never had to do with any but women and children. My dear Athos, I admire you, but nevertheless we were in the wrong after all. How in the wrong? said Athos. Whose, then, is the air we breathe? Whose is the ocean upon which we look? Whose is the sand upon which we were reclining? Whose is the letter of your mistress? Do these belong to the cardinal? Upon my honor, this man fancies the world belongs to him. There you stood, stammering, stupefied, annihilated. One might have supposed the Bastille appeared before you, and that the gigantic Medusa had converted you into stone. Is being in love conspiring? You are in love with a woman with whom the cardinal has caused to be shut up, and you wish to get her out of the hands of the cardinal. That's a match you are playing with his eminence. This letter is your game. Why should you expose your game to your adversary? That is never done. Let him find it out if he can. We can find out his. Well, that's all very sensible, Athos, said D'Artagnan. In that case, let there be no more question of what's past and let Aramis resume the letter from his cousin, where the cardinal interrupted him. Aramis drew the letter from his pocket. The three friends surrounded him, and the three lackeys grouped themselves again near the wine-jar. "'You had only read a line or two, said D'Artagnan. "'Read the letter again from the commencement.' "'Willingly,' said Aramis. "'My dear cousin, I think I shall make up my mind to set out for Bethune.' where my sister has placed our little servant in the convent of the Carmelites. This poor child is quite resigned, as she knows she cannot live elsewhere without the salvation of her soul being in danger. Nevertheless, if the affairs of our family are arranged, as we hope they will be, I believe she will run the risk of being damned, and will return to those she regrets, particularly as she knows they are always thinking of her." Meanwhile, she is not very wretched. What she most desires is a letter from her intended. I know that such viands pass with difficulty through convent gratings, but after all, as I have given you proofs, my dear cousin, I am not unskilled in such affairs, and I will take charge of the commission. My sister thanks you for your good and eternal remembrance. She has experienced much anxiety— but she is now at length a little reassured, having sent her secretary away, in order that nothing may happen unexpectedly. Adieu, my dear cousin. Tell us news of yourself as often as you can. That is to say, as often as you can with safety. I embrace you. Marie Michon. Oh, what do I not owe you, Aramis? said D'Artagnan. Dear Constance, I have at length, then, intelligence of you. She lives. She is in safety in a convent. She is at Bethune. Uh, where is Bethune, Athos? 
why, upon the frontiers of Artois and of Flanders, the siege once over, we shall be able to make a tour in that direction. And that will not be long, it is to be hoped, said Porthos, for they have this morning hanged a spy who confessed that the Rochelais were reduced to the leather of their shoes, supposing that after having eaten the leather they eat the soles, I cannot see much that is left unless they eat one another. Poor fools, said Athos, emptying a glass of excellent Bordeaux wine, which, without having at that period the reputation it now enjoys, merited it no less. Poor fools, as if the Catholic religion was not the most advantageous and the most agreeable of all religions. All the same, resumed he after having clicked his tongue against his palate, they are brave fellows. But what the devil are you about, Aramis? continued Athos. Why are you squeezing that letter into your pocket? Yes, said D'Artagnan. Athos is right. It must be burned. And yet if we burn it, who knows whether Monsieur Cardinal has not a secret to interrogate ashes? He must have one, said Athos. "'What will you do with the letter, then?' asked Porthos. "'Come here, Grimaud,' said Athos. Grimaud rose and obeyed. "'As a punishment for having spoken without permission, my friend, you will please to eat this piece of paper. Then, to recompense you for the service you will have rendered us, you shall afterward drink this glass of wine. First, here is the letter. Eat heartily.' Grimaud smiled, and with his eyes fixed upon the glass which Athos held in his hand, he ground the paper well between his teeth, and then swallowed it. "'Bravo, Monsieur Grimaud,' said Athos, "'and now take this. That's well. We dispense with your saying grace.' Grimaud silently swallowed the glass of Bordeaux wine, but his eyes raised toward heaven during this delicious occupation spoke a language which, though mute, was not the less expressive. "'And now,' said Athos, "'unless Monsieur Cardinal should form the ingenious idea of ripping up Grimaud, I think we may be pretty much at our ease respecting the letter.' Meantime his eminence continued his melancholy ride, murmuring between his moustaches, these four men must positively be mine. End of chapter 51. Recording by John Van Stan, Savannah, Georgia. I love that Richelieu's reaction to knowing that these guys have put one over on him is not to try and find a way to bring them down, but in trying to find a way to get them to work for him. This, he is such a smart bad guy. I love this. It must really show just how lazy a lot of our entertainment writing has gotten when it comes to antagonists these days, at least in popular media, because I am finding myself so enamored of characters like Richelieu and Long John Silver I mean, I know that they're really written well, too, but I'm not sure how, how much of it is they look glorious in comparison, or they've always been that glorious, and, and we also have glorious ones today. I'm just not noticing. I don't know. But oh, I love, I love any time Richelieu and Athos get to talk to each other. One of the things that I didn't mention before is that uh, Marianne Delorme she actually shows up in a later book by Alexandre Dumas, Queen Margot, and is a more important character there as well. I think Dumas really, after Count of Monte Cristo, kind of hits a stride with including more and more women in interesting and complex roles. That seems to be something that continues to crop up in all of the literary criticism in the notes that I'm finding. So I thought that was kind of interesting. I also loved how carefully worded the letter was that Aramis received from his ahem, ahem, cousin. Ahem. I thought it was, it was beautifully tactfully done and a really 
tour de force in not saying what you're saying while making sure that the other person can understand what you're saying. And because of that, we know that Constance is in a convent and she is safe and she'll be a lot safer, happier as soon as she knows that D'Artagnan is okay and thinking of her. And so now that that has been communicated, things are good. This is awesome. There's also a Porthos kind of breaks into the narrative with like, I'm going to be a jokester today, which often he does. But this this one had a, a tinge of ouch too soon because the people in La Rochelle really were being starved out. Like the the dirty tricks that Richelieu was employing of kind of tossing leaflets. I mean, they weren't leaflets, but getting information inside the walls of La Rochelle to tell them that their leaders had plenty of wheat. They just weren't sharing any of it. That kind of dirty pool is is rough, especially when the people are quite definitely starving. So I found Porthos's, yeah, I understand that they're eating the leather of their shoes and pretty soon they're going to eat the soles. And I thought, you know what? Even at the time, I wonder if that wasn't too much. That's just... That was not far off from how bad it got for these people. So <laughs> we'll see. I'm, I'm sure that Porthos is going to redeem himself in, in my eyes at some point. So Christmassy things. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Those of you who have suggested Christmas stories, really good suggestions. Thank you. Totally hunting down to make sure that some of these are going to be legal to use. And if they are then I'm gonna. If you would like to Zoom with me, talk to me, record something about why you particularly love this story that you submitted, please do. You can email heather at craftlit.com or eric, E-R-I-K, at craftlit.com. And one of us can work out how, when, all of that information for getting some audio for you on the show. And we are planning to do the 12 Days of Craft Lit. Just like in previous times, there won't be a whole lot of conversating about the texts. Mostly it's just going to be, we found nice stories for you. And here, something to listen to that's pleasant and Christmassy at Christmas time. Plus, that way I can still keep working on the Three Musketeers and finish the book with you. So, there we are. I hope you have a great week. I will talk to you soon. Take care of yourself. Be well. Have a great one. Bye. A big thanks to all the Craftlet listeners who support the show by being a premium audio member via craftlit.com slash premium or via patreon.com slash craftlit. Your support for the show is what's kept us going since 2006. If you feel like getting free audio pretty much every week, please consider supporting the show by heading over to patreon.com slash craftlit and pledging what you feel the show is worth to you. If you can't support the show that way, consider leaving a review at iTunes or at our facebook.com slash craftlit page or follow at craftlit on Twitter and share the show with your followers too. And remember, if your hands are too busy to pick up a book, at least you can turn one on. Mm -hmm.